All right. Amen. You guys are excited about tonight already. I just want to say one thing about night of ministry is that um, whether you whether you receive anything prophetically or not, it, there's something dynamically when we have the place full and people are just going after the heart of God. And I know that where worship belongs to the Lord, I'll always contend for that, always know that. But there's something about also that worship has an effect in us too. When water rushes through the pipe, the pipe can't help but get wet. Some of you deep theologians will figure that out in a minute. So there's something about worship that it's not only just for the Lord, but when we give ourselves to honoring and blessing and just leave nothing on the table, just completely just be consumed with him, then uh, there, there's a transformation I really believe is a help with that. I grew up hearing about that and around that. My first, one of the first books, second book I read, first was Watch My Knees, which was, man, it was deep. And the second, as, as an 18-year-old, was uh, Prison to Praise, Merlin Carruthers' book. And my mother told me, she said, if you understand this, it'll get you out of any problem. And so I began to realize that he's talking about being in prison and so how Paul and Silas did and all that. But if you understand and learn how to give yourself to worship, not just singing songs off the screen, that's, that's singing, that's not worship. Worship is the adoration, it's the, that giving one's innermost being and loving the Lord, just disconnecting from all the external stuff and you're just internalizing how good and how gracious he is. That science has even proven that the endorphins, the melatonins and oxytocins and all the other ends on that just makes you feel good and makes you feel better. I was, um, somebody was doing a science thing and they were saying, um, and they gave some the information I won't go into. And they said, if you'll stand two minutes with your hands lifted straight up every day and praying in tongues, that it rejuvenates your spirit, soul, and body. Well, if you don't pray in tongues, that'd be a good way to start right there. Just begin to just offer yourself, which is the position of a priest offering a sacrifice with hands lifted, according to Psalms 141. So there's something about finding a, something physically that's so refreshing by being in the presence of the Lord where there's fullness of that much. So I'm excited about tonight and uh, there'll be people coming from different places. Got some friends from Austin that have come down uh, for, for, this, for this event. So we're believing God, uh, we never know what'll happen. We just know that it will. And we just suit up and show up and see what God will do from that point. I began sharing last week and I wanna kind of plug a book that's not even here yet. Uh, the Power of Right Thinking just came out. In fact, I have just got two copies that for viewer only. They send this off to televisions and, and radios and I'll be on Sid Roth in March 31st, I think, is when we're doing the shoot for this book. But I, you know, written some other stuff before, but this is the thing that, that has so excited me about this is because, uh, and it connects with what I'm sharing this morning, about understanding how the kingdom of God operates. If you, we can change our thinking, how we think about things, we can change every part of our being. Proverbs 23 says, as one thinks in his heart, so is he, or one translation, so he is on his way to becoming. If you think God is against you, then you will be very defensive, paranoid, and backing away from everything he's doing, wondering what to expect next. But if you believe and in your thinking have been transformed in your thinking, know that God is good and he loves you with an everlasting love, then you see everything with, everything's gonna be good. Everything's gonna happen, it's gonna turn out good. Even though it may not look like it right now, the end will be good because God is good and I'm in his favor. So it just really gives you an understanding of that. And so I'm not plugging to buy it because you can't right now anyway. And so um, there's a portion in there that I'll, I'll share about this morning as well. Turn with me to Matthew, the 11th chapter. And this is uh, part two, talking about uh, the kingdom of God. And last week we talked about the governing of the kingdom of God. And when you read in scripture, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God, and that's interchangeable, those two terms, is that it really is not just talking about, uh, you know, heaven, waiting till, till heaven comes, but it's refer referring essentially to a way of governing. It's a form of government. Jesus said in John 18, 36, and I shared this last week, and I'm gonna give you a synopsis, and then we'll move on into this. My kingdom is not of this realm, or lest my servants would be standing with me or fighting with me here. By that token, he's saying there is a kingdom, there is an invisible kingdom that we don't see with the natural eyes, but it's as real or more real because it's eternal 
than the kingdoms of governing that we see the United States, European, Middle Eastern, whatever other governments are, he is the kingdom that shall not find an end. Isaiah 9 says, and is speaking of messianic prophecy, a son is given, and he's saying, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and to his government there shall be no ending. In other words, a continual ruling that point. Then why not plug into a kingdom or a governing, form of governing, that is not going to end with a change of a presidency, with a change of a fall of a government, or a change of a currency, or any kind of change like that. And what's good, Jesus even referred to this, and he told us that referred to this when he's saying, the rule and dominion is not of this realm, but there is one that, that does rule and have dominion. And then we find in First John, he says, as he is, speaking of Jesus, as he is, so are we in this present realm or present time. So if we understand that, that we're not waiting to get to heaven for this rulership to begin to take place, it is dominant to right now to those that allow it to be dominant. The word kingdom comes the word basileia, which means a dominion or the, the influence or the stretch of a king. So when he's saying the kingdom of God to us is not just a, an idea, it's not a place, it's not just a spiritual thing, but it's to the level that we, we understand that, that his kingdom is in us and not just around us. And to the level that we allow the dominion of that king have influence over us is to the same level that we have the favor of the king that has influence over us. So when we begin to pray, we're praying from the mindset of a king that is dominant inside of us. And so when we, we talk about the kingdoms of this world, the Bible talks about, Jesus refers to it, the kingdoms of this age or the kingdoms of this world. He's talking about the influences around us. And never before have we had the kind of intensity and pressure and influence on us that we have right now. You know, your kids will say, uh, did they have televisions when you were, when you were a kid? <laughs> no, and we just used tin cans and strings to communicate, you know. We rode on rocks. Well, yeah, they did. But the thing is, we don't have the influence it is right now to where continually that there is sensuality, sexuality that sells everything and anything. They'll, they'll use that to sell you on a vacation. It is continually in you to desensitize to where this is normal. And the more you get into the kingdoms of this world, the less domination or the less influence the kingdom of God has on us. Till eventually the new normal is that everybody's doing it and it's okay to where we, what the Bible calls, and I, li I love what we were seeing this morning about the fire of God, becomes lukewarm. Lukewarm means there's mixture. Got a little bit of hot, a little bit of cold. I haven't totally backslidden, but I don't feel as strong about the presence of God as I once did. He's just there. He figures into my life in a, in a kind of a compartmentalized thought. But with the understanding were that, that the kingdom of God, when Jesus said, if I by the hand of God have cast out Satan, then he said the kingdom of God has come to you. So Jesus gives us one understanding of the kingdom of God is a demonstration and power of this king. And he said, this is the real normal thing. It's not abnormal when you see someone get healed. It is the normal. We just need to get used to the new normal and have less influence of the domination of the kingdoms of this world. And so how we begin to do that is first of all, is you have to press in and set your heart and your affection on things above, not on things in the earth. And then he said in Isaiah 26, three, I, have, I keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon me. So he's saying there's really a constant uh, discipline of the heart and mind is I need to keep the Lord before me at all times. Right. Jesus operated in the kingdom of God here on earth in the kingdoms of this world, which means he says, I always do what I see the father do. That is really a literal translation in the sense that Jesus was so aware of what God, God was saying and prompting him to do that he didn't have to figure out, uh, really, did you mean that or did you really mean something else? And he continually stayed in prayer. I liked what we did this morning, praying one for another. That's why the Bible says my house shall be called the house of prayer. Pray one for another. You know, confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be healed. So he puts fault and physical healing right in the same context because one affects the other. 
So Jesus understood what God was doing in the kingdom of God, and he's saying the kingdom of God has come to you in might and power. So I want to look at this, how this, this government forms within us. Marriage, let me just say this about marriage. Marriage is a, is a covenant. And the word berith is the word covenant, which means to cut. Jesus cut the covenant on the cross with us when he was cut. And when he cut that covenant, it is not a covenant like a contract you would have with someone else in a partnership. A contract is two parties of equal ability to perform their, what the contract says that they're to do. Jesus knew because of Adam that Adam would fail and he would, he would falter because of his own humanity. And so Jesus didn't make covenant with us. He made covenant with the Father in behalf of us. You can see that there in, uh, there in Genesis with, with, uh, when he put Abraham to sleep and the, the torch in the oven came walking between the sacrifice. That torch in that oven was actually a typology of the Father and the Son. And Abraham was over there asleep. So God has come to make covenant with his son. So he says, when we allow this king to rule and govern inside of us, there is a covenantal right that the son has with the father. They says, they, when I see the blood, I have, the death angel has to pass over. When I see what my son's influence has done in your life, all of this other things that is for death and destruction to take you away from the presence of God have to pass over. But for everybody that was outside of the house, Though there was blood on the, over the house, there in Exodus 12, those outside the house did not have the favor or the covenant of that covenant. It's not enough just to believe in him, you have to walk in him and you have to stay in him. By doing so, we understand that he says, I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes because I have covenant with my father. All right, look with me at 11, Matthew the 11th chapter. And Jesus, you've heard me say this uh, probably over the, the past number of years at various times. Let's pick it up in um, Matthew 11 chapter and verse 11. Jesus is giving a tremendous compliment to John the Baptist. Now, if you went back to Matthew, the third chapter, you would see where 400 years of silence had, had between Malachi and the New Testament was roughly 400 years. And it opens with John the Baptist he breaks silence by saying, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The first words that God uses to break the 400 years of silence is the kingdom of God is at hand. The New Testament is the introduction into the kingdom of God and the introduction of the king of the kingdom into us. So he starts out by saying, uh, Jesus saying, assuredly I say to you among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Wouldn't you like Jesus to say that about you? You're the best there is, man. One born of, born of human. You're the greatest thing there is since sliced bread. Then he says, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He gives it and he takes it away, right? Not really, because he's saying, John operated in all the revelation that he had up to that point. There is another way moving deeper into, and that's the kingdom of heaven. John preached about the kingdom of God, but never entered into the kingdom of God. He lost his head before he got there, literally. <laughs> Look at verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, notice the transformation before this and after this. Until now, the day John the Baptist was preaching the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. That word violence has been misunderstood, misconstrued, mispreached over the centuries more than any other topic that I'm aware of in scripture. I was growing up in church and I, I was taught that the word violent there meant someone who was more militant and more radical than someone else. He said the kingdom of God is just gonna be those who violently, radically, and just go after the Lord. And that's true in a, in a small sense of that. But the word violent there, or the violent, is the word biazo, B-I-A-D-Z-O. It's a very strong word. Biazo means to crowd out or leave no room for anything else to grow in. To take over the space so that it has no other room for, for more than one thing in that place at all. There's no mixture at all in there. So the original would read something like this. The kingdom of God is experiencing biazo or crowding out. Because when this king of the kingdom comes in, 
he starts moving everything else out that is not of his governance. He begins to push out everything that that presupposes that it's wanting to have its governance or influence over that space. Because remember, a king would have a a realm or he'd have uh, boundaries and markers and saying, this is my dominion, my borders, if you will. He goes throughout that realm and he looks to see if there's anything that is of a mixture or that tries to say something contrary to the very nature or the governance of that king. So when Jesus is making this statement, they would have understood this in a greater way than we do now. He's saying this king is coming in from the 400 years of silence and now, John, you've been preaching about it. Repentance is the way to transition or transform into this new kingdom. But now with this new king coming in, everything is going to be different from this time on. The Bible says, Paul makes this statement, what know you not that your body is the temple the place, the the domain of God because you've been bought and paid for by the price of Jesus and therefore it means the fact that he owns us now. He says in Ephesians 4 that when Jesus, before he, he went to heaven, he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He first descended before he ascended and he took captive those that were there before, before the gospel of the kingdom could be preached and he led them out of captivity but he still took them captive. That means that when Jesus saved you and I, it wasn't for the ideas to set us free to where we could go back and do our own thing, how we wanted to do it, with who we wanted to do it, and how we wanted to do it, and have our own thinking and have our own way. He said he took us captive and he kept us captive. And now we're captivated by him. It is a love slave relationship in such a way that I love him so much that I don't want any other one governing over my life. I don't even want me governing over me. Because God knows what I'd do with that. So what he is saying is, I've come to crowd out all of the thoughts that I didn't place there. I've come to crowd out all the other gods that, are, that, uh, that we've placed in our life to crowd out. And there's a war going on inside. So when people tell me that, man, I just, I just feel so torn. I just feel so agitated all the time. Is you need to give up. Because he says, you'll hate the one, master, and then follow him and embrace him, or you will follow after the other one and love him. So there, that we have to come to this point of saying, I am giving myself totally to Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life, that he has access in my life 24-7 to all parts of my life. Nothing is off limits. Nothing is off the table. He can talk to me about anything. He can talk to me about sex. He can talk to me about money. He can talk to me about attitude. He can talk to me about being offensive. He can talk to me about anything because I'm not going to say, I'm sorry, Jesus, we're not going to talk about that or go there. So when this king of the kingdom comes in, his expansion starts moving in like water, just filling up an empty glass and begins to pour in that way. If you would go into to, uh, uh, Matthew, the 12th chapter, and it says, when an unclean spirit is taken out of a house, cleansed out of the house, kicked out of the house, we're happy because we got delivered, but they will come back again, they will test that house and to see if that house has been filled with anything. The idea is not just to be emptied out, but the idea is to be filled. Because if there's not something filling our life fully, then there's the opportunity for the enemy to come back in and bring, the Bible says, bring seven worse than themselves and begin to take over the house and begin to take over thinking. That's why today when you see Christians that fall away from God, they're some of the most most vicious and vile people than if they've never known the Lord at all is because now they're filled with a, with a greater intensity than they ever have before. So he said, in order, first of all, you have to bind the strong man of the house so then you can come in and fill and take over and have dominion in the house. Jesus came in to bind the strong man of the house. And sometimes that strong man is not a demon, but it's our will. It's that point of binding our will. Now, you can't bind flesh and flesh that takes the spirit of God to bring conviction to deal with that will and we still have a will whether we want to submit to that at all. So when Jesus says the kingdom of God is like this, it comes in, it begins to crowd out. All right, as we go along, keep in reference that this is how the kingdom of God operates, not just in a sinful way, but in every way. There is a, a prosperity that comes with the king of kings. 
He tells us in Deuteronomy, it is, it is the Lord who gives you the power to make wealth. Not say, didn't say get wealth, it means to make wealth. The fact is the creativity, the ability for that to happen. So I, I'm, I'm the king, he's the king that comes and he, I give you the abilities of the kingdom of God. But I've come to crowd out poverty. I come to crowd out fear. I've come out to, cre- to crowd out the fear of failure. I've come out to crowd out the, the spirit of lust. I've come to crowd out the offenses. I've come to crowd out anything that would try to depose this king upon the, on the throne of God. So it's just not the idea of sin. It is he wants to come in. He wants to rule in such a way that he takes over the entirety of the house and, and have full dominion at that point. All right. Look with me to Ephesians, the fourth chapter. And... Uh, and verse 27, while you're turning there, I'll just quote it to you. <laughs> Paul says it like this, and he's referring to, to a number of issues, but he's saying, give no ground, the word is topos, to the devil. Let him who steal quit it, quit stealing, but rather work with your hands, laboring the hands, that which is good, that he may somehow or another have something to give. So in that essence, he's saying, if I don't come in and crowd it out and there's room for the devil there, he just doesn't take that small little bit of ground. He begins to move in and move in and move in. It starts off with a toe hold, then he gets a hand hold, and then he gets a foot hold, and then he gets a neck hold. And he will not stop till eventually the case with Adam and Eve. I don't believe that, that one day that serpent showed up and said, hey, this one thing and that was it. I think there was a continual working or speaking from this serpent towards Eve, showing her, have you ever thought about this or think about this? And how do you think that God's trying to keep you from something? There's more out there than what you think. He starts wearing on our mind and our thinking. That's why Paul says it is by the renewing of the mind is transformation happening. It's if I think God's against me, so I respond and act like he's against me. If I think everybody's against me, I start acting very defensive towards everybody and everything. So there's changing the mind begins to allow the the governance of the kingdom of God to operate. Now, the last part of Matthew 11, and they said the kingdom of God has experienced violent and then the violent take it by force. The word force there is harpazo. The same word that he uses for the word that we would say the catching away or rapture. It's to seize, grab hold on suddenly. So he said, those that have allowed this king to crowd out stuff out of their life, then they have the opportunity to take hold of him as well as him taking hold of us. I am pursuing him, but now I've, I've grabbed a hold of him. And that's why the, the, the Bible teaches in, the, in Luke the ninth chapter, about verse 62 or so, he says, no man who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. So he's saying there is a way, not only the kingdom come, but you have to step into the kingdom and grab hold of it as well. It's not just a one way thing to where he's gonna come and grab you, but Paul said that which I have been been apprehended for, I now have have to apprehend. I've been caught, I've been called for something, but now I have to respond to that call as well. It's not a matter of saying, well, Jesus, if you're gonna do it, go ahead and do it, fine with me. There's something on my part that I have to pursue after him. It's not a wonder that Matthew 6, 33 is, is a no, known verse. Seek first. Word first is protos, which means the chief passion for. Seek first the kingdom of God, which should be your chief passion because it's the king, Jesus. And all these other things that you have been praying and believing and, and concerned about over will be added to you. But most of us, we start seeking the stuff and we have never had a relationship with the kingdom, king of the kingdom. So the priorities get out of order, but they're saying, so the, seek first to prioritize the kingdom of God, the chief passion, which is the protos, first the kingdom of God. So he's saying, when you have the kingdom of God and you operate in the kingdom of God, all you're gonna understand how to pray, you're gonna understand with a mindset that's governing us, how that we see things and the perspective that we see them and things that have caused worry and concern before will no longer see it in the same way that we've seen before. We've, our eyes have been open to the truth. I was in uh, North Richland Hills, uh, a place uh, there in Dallas and this last week and, and it's a, a 
home, in fact, there's a home group leaders, uh, some group of leaders there. And I was just sharing about um, having transformed thinking. And there was a guy there, a big, large guy. And he was sitting the whole time in the meeting. And he just, he looked like my, my wife drugged me in here, you know. And it's Friday night, and where am I? I'm sitting in a house listening to this guy talk. I could be out doing something better than this. So you could tell he was uncomfortable with that. So anyway, at the end of the meeting, I walked back to him and I asked him his name. And he said his name was Edward. You could tell like, oh boy. And I said, Edward, someone has labeled you as a young man. They labeled you and said that you weren't going to be worth anything. He went from feeling like this to where he just fell over and he just started crying his eyes out and bawling his eyes out. His wife was on top of me crying. And, there was, and the whole thing was because he said, I said, I'm not here to tell you what they said. I'm here to tell you what Jesus has said. Jesus has said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You have not disappointed the father. He loves you with an everlasting love. There's nothing you could do to, to try to improve your relationship with God. He loves you because he paid the price for you. That guy is thinking completely did a 180 and a where before the meeting was over, he would have had his hands lifted up and he was going after the Lord with a whole heart. Because somehow in our thinking that we, we have a mindset that keeps us dumbed down in a position to where the influence of this king, it's for everybody else, but it's not for me. I know he heals other people, but I don't know that he would do that for me. I know other people get blessed, but I don't, it doesn't happen for me. So therefore the problem must be with me. It's a kingdom mindset and thinking. And as, the day, as we go through these weeks ahead, we're going to get into how the kingdom finances operate in the kingdom, how relationships will operate in the kingdom, and how that we, we spiritually operate and under the, uh, against the demonic forces in the kingdom. But until, first of all, the kingdom of God governs me, then I don't have really any dominion and power over anything that tries to hit me. I can know a few scriptures and sometimes I, I get effective in that until I recognize that the kingdom of God is at hand and which greater is the kingdom of God is inside of me. Yeah. Reminds me when I was young and this kid kept bullying me and fighting me you know, all the time, bigger kid than I was. He was two years older than me and I was about the fourth or fifth grade and so anyway, I heard my brother's car. He picked me up every day at school barreling down. He had Hollywood glass packs on his 63 Malibu. <laughs> That's here coming down the road. And so all of a sudden, I got bold. I thought, you touch me again, and I'm going to knock you in the next week. Because that's what I heard my dad say one time. I'm going to knock you in the middle of next week. This kid says, oh, yeah? And about that time, Randy opened the door, and, I, and Randy says, Carrie, let's go. And I said, Randy, this guy wants to fight you. <laughs> he goes, what, what? He come barreling out of that car. And, of course, Randy, he was, you know, he's about 16, 17 years, which he looked like he was a, he was a hulk. And so he came out of there and he, he grabbed this kid by the shoulder and he said, if you ever say another bad word to my brother, I'm going to come and find you wherever you are. Do you hear me? <laughs> never heard from the kid again. He never even come on that side of the school again. <laughs> Greater is he. <laughs> That's inside of you. And I hear my brother's voice many times in my head today. Jesus is inside of you saying, I'm willing to stand up for you, but the, the influence that I have on the inside of you must be to the point that you know that I'm with you and not just in crisis seasons. I'm just not going to pull you out of the fire every, every year or so. I want to walk with you in such an intimacy and a level of communion and fellowship so that you'll never get into that position. I want to be preventative and not just proactive in that sense of that word. Okay. Turn with me to the Hebrews 11th chapter. Second key of the kingdom of God, first one is, is governing, how he rules, having rule, ruled in us. The second is that the kingdom of God operates from a principle of substance. Hebrews 11, chapter and verse one, that you know it well, says now faith, the word faith, pistas, which means it's an action term. It doesn't mean cognitive thinking, I believe in my mind. It means I've believed it, but now I'm acting on it. Faith is the responsive to what I've believed. So if you only believe in something, you don't act on it, it's not faith yet. It says faith is the substance. The word substance, hupostasis. If you've ever been to a Jewish wedding, you probably saw them marry, get married under a hoopah. 
means a structure that's over the top of you is a hupa. Hupostasis means a, a structure or a, a strong foundation that you're standing under and over. So as faith is substance, uh, that means it's covering, it's over the top of you. When you look at all the things through scripture, how when God was being creative, and there's a creativity in the kingdom of God. As I said, the power to make wealth, I believe is a kingdom response to that. He first comes in to has to crowd out the fear of poverty or the fear of failure. Poverty is not the lack of money. The poverty is the fear of keeping what I have at whatever level. And poverty keeps us from giving. So the keeping us from giving is, is renouncing that I really trust God with who I am and what I have. And I never can get beyond my own ability. So he's saying with that, the kingdom of God is made up of substance. When God created man, that he created from substance. When God wanted to create something, he first of all decided the substance from which he wanted to create, and then he would speak to that substance. In the case of man, man was created from the dust of the earth. And then God breathed into him, as two different words in, the, in, the, in Genesis. There's the word create and the word make, two distinct words. And the, he said he created him, I see, from the dust of the earth. That means creating from substance that already exists. And then he says, then God made or created man. If God first made him, dust of the earth, and then created him is the word breda, which means to create from substance that doesn't even exist. So when God breathed into man, that was giving him substance that did not exist on this world, but it came from another world. And the Bible says that man became a living spirit or speaking spirit, a living being, but a speaking spirit. Man became a speaking spirit at that moment, meaning the fact he was more dominant spiritually than he was dominant in his mind, will, and intellect or physically. And that's where God wants us to do. The kingdom of God is governing by, by a spiritual dominion. That's why he says the kingdom of God does, doesn't come by you observing. You can't see it. It's not like a castle and a king and the, the king's castle's over there because he said the kingdom of God is within you. So that means it's internal governance of this king. And when this governance is inside of us, then he makes available to us principles and keys of the kingdom of God. If I had time, I'd take you through testimony, several testimonies financially, and I'll, I probably will in days ahead, where Di and I took the Bible at its, at its very, what it says its word, and began to see it come back. It works. It works in, in a dynamically way. So with this understanding, he's saying, that there's substance, what kind of substance do we give the Lord for him to work with? We pray and then we give God nothing to work with. God, you do it. Jesus said, when the son of man returns, will he find faith, substantive action on the earth? God, you do it. Well, give me something to work with. When Jesus was in there in John, the second chapter, and Jesus attended the, first, the wedding at Cana, it was his first miracle there. I don't know that Jesus purposely uh, went there for the miracle. It didn't appear that he was planning on doing a miracle, but we have to understand that he knew what God wanted to do. He comes to the wedding and somewhere in the middle of the wedding, the wine gives out, which is a bad thing for a Jewish wedding. And so they understood that it was a cultural issue, that it, was, uh, uh, it, it made the host family look very bad and look very unprepared that they didn't care about their guests. You've invited me to a celebration and you didn't prepare for me. So there was an issue involved there. His mother comes to him and he said, son, uh, we're out of wine here. And he makes this statement back to her that sounds very callous. He said, what do I have to do with you? Which is very poor language in, in the English. But he said, what is it that you want me to do? And she said, well, we don't have any wine. And he said, my time is not yet. In other words, it's not my time to do a miracle. What would change Jesus' mind? I, I, I know without any doubt that he wanted to do it. But the new covenant had not been ratified, had not been brought into that. What is it that you want me to do? But then she said to him, instead of saying to, you know, listening to Jesus, like, my time's not yet. Like, I don't pay attention to that. Nonetheless, whatever he says to you, go do it. She moved from being told, no, I can't, to all of a sudden, faith moves beyond the realm of possibilities and says, whatever he's going to say to you, if you do it, It'll be done. 
You see the care of the, where the Syrophoenician woman, when she comes to him and, and she's, she's, uh, she's not even a Jew and she's begging him, please, and my child is sick. And, and Jesus said, it's not lawful. I'm still operating under an old covenant here. It's not lawful for me to give the children's bread, which was healing for the Jews, and give healing to a non-Jew or a Gentile. Instead of hearing that and being offended at what he said, which most of us would have done, she said, yes, Lord, that's true, but even the dogs, which were called the Gentiles, the dogs even eat the crumbs from the table. Jesus was so moved at that. Instead of waiting for it, you've got to wait you know, another few years before this covenant can be ratified. She couldn't wait years. She had a need now. So in the principle of the kingdom that there is a quantum leap of time, a quantum leap of dispensation, a quantum leap of so many things because in the kingdom of God, she operated in faith. And when she said, yes, Lord, I know what the law says, but if I can just even have bread coming from the table, which represents, you know, faith in saying that you are the bread. If I can just one crumb from you, my child will be healed. And Jesus said, I haven't seen faith like this in all the earth. Go, your child is hit. But Jesus, you're operating under an old covenant. How could you do that? It's because he really was here, but he was operating in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, faith releases what has been held off for another day. Isn't that interesting? Jesus there in the wedding goes to those people and there were six water pots there, 30 gallons apiece. Do the math. 180 gallons of water. And he could have said, okay, there's your wine. But he told them, though, you take and you begin to pour out the water. And it was the obedience of pouring it out. Most of it would say, once I see wine in the pot, then I'll pour it out. But I'm not pouring out until I see something. But the act of movement in that was, was the kingdom operative, which means I'm operating in faith. It now has given substance to what I believe. The kingdom of God operates in substance that God will take that as an act of faith and begins to move in response to it. In essence, he's saying, give me something to work with. I've told this testimony a number of times, well, it's concerning Hudson Taylor, but it fits in so apropos here. Hudson Taylor was a, a, a missionary to the Chinese islands. And uh, one particular story talks about Hudson. This was before that there was any motorized uh, ships. They were all sailing ships. And one particular day, Hudson was resting between, between the islands. He was asleep, and, and uh, it became such a dead calm on the, on the sea. Then all of a sudden, the captain came to him and said, wake Hudson up. We're drifting towards Cannibal Islands. I mean, they're out there, you know, sharpening their knives and thanking God for dinner. And Hudson tells the captain, we'll put up the sails. And he said, no, it, it's a lot of work putting up the sails, and and there's no reason to put up sails unless we have wind. And Hudson said, if you don't put up the sails, we're, we're not, I'm not going to pray. Finally convinced the captain to put up the sails, dead calm. He begins to pray. And the story was that like, it was like a tornado cyclone came out of the heavens and hit the sails and pushed them back out to sea. What would it have been if the wind came and there was no sails to catch it? There's times that we're asking God to do something and we give him nothing to blow against, nothing to move on, nothing to touch, nothing to move in response to that. The kingdom of God operates with substance and what kind of substance do we give him to give? Whatever substance you sow is out of that substance you will reap. So in essence, is if you financially give, that is a substance that there's a reaping financially out of that. If you give kindness and mercy and you give, you give people you know, a smile, then there's something out of that that's also sown. It is substance to the kingdom of God. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence. The fact that you operate in substance, substance is evidence of what's not seen. Faith is not blind, it has evidence. There's evidence that you have faith because of what you did in response to. You're here this morning because that is evidence that you believe that there is a living God. That's evidence. And thus you live your life in such a way that's an evidence or substance that I believe that what he said he was doing, that one day he's going to come back for me and take me out of here. 
That's evidence. Your faith is evidence from that point. Now, what's interesting with this, turn with me and look at um, 2 Kings, the fourth chapter. You can find a number of places in Scripture where, where God is uh, responding to people's substance that they, they give to them. This is the widow and the oil, and verse 1, it describes that she was one of the wives of the, the prophets. There was a school of prophets, and she was one of the wives of the, the prophets. He died, and uh, she's now, because there was no income coming in, the creditors have come and wanted to take her children and put them into servitude to pay off her debt. She had been operating on a credit card. That'll get you in trouble right there. So verse two, Elisha said to her, what shall I do for you? Because she's telling him, I'm, I'm, one of my, my, my uh, husband used to serve with you. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? Notice that her husband had been sowing into and her husband had been giving substance to before the need ever rose. You see that? So what, what shall I do for you? Tell me what do you have in the house? Well, you're a prophet, don't you know what I have in the house? But he wanted her to say it in response. What do you have in the house? And she said, your maid servant has nothing. Notice it starts out nothing, nothing but a little bit of oil in a small jar. Then he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere. We used to sing a song. It's on page, uh, him on page 100 in the melodies of praise. Bring your vessels, not a few. I could almost sing it for you, but I don't think you'd want that. <laughs> Literally, that's true. It's on page 100, I can still see it in my mind's eye. It says, go borrow vessels from all of your neighbors everywhere. Do not gather just a few. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons then pour it out into those vessels and set aside the full ones. So she went and, and from him and shut the door behind her and did as the prophet said and poured it out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. So the walls deceased, ceased. And she came and told the, the man of God and he said, go sell the oil, pay your debt and you and your sons live on the rest. Now notice he didn't just say to her, I'm just going to believe God right now that your debt is paid. But he says to her, what have you got that's a substantive, a hypostasis, something that you can stand under as a structure that you believe God is the God of the impossible. If she had said, listen here, guy, my, my husband poured in many, many hours for you and with you, and you're going to take the last little jar of oil I got. You're nothing more than a TV evangelist. Try to get the last nickel out of my pocket. But what he was saying is, give me some, some substance so that God can do the miracle. If you got water, you want wine, what is it that you have in the house? So she goes and, and uh, does exactly what he's saying and the miracle begins to take place. Another interesting that, that's somewhat different, but it connects with that, First Kings, the 17th chapter, and the two I, I want to set, uh, set together in, in concert with this. First Kings 17. <laughs> Elijah had pronounced a drought at the prompting of God and, uh, and because of the drought that even affected him. Then the word of the Lord came to him in verse two, get away from there and turn eastward and hide by the brook Kirith, which flows in the Jordan and it will be that you shall drink from the brook and, it shall, and I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Remember, I remember a message I preached on a place called there. How many places in scripture say, God says, I'll, I'll meet you there. I'll take care of you there. It didn't say, you figure it out and then I'll do it wherever you are. No, that's a commandment there. And he said, I'll command the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and stayed by the brook, which flows in the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning. I mean, you're talking about room service. Bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook. You know what the miracle out of this is? that the ravens didn't eat the meat and bread on the way there. Because they're scavenger birds, they'll eat anything. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him and saying, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon and dwell there. And see, I've commanded a widow there. I've commanded ravens at the brook there. Now I've commanded a widow there. You just couldn't go find any widow 
You had to be the widow there. And so <laughs> he goes there. I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. Notice that she's already been commanded. She just doesn't know it yet. God's already moving in towards the need. So he rose and he went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water and a cup that I may drink. And, and as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, oh yeah, and please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. In other words, don't send it. I want you to have it in your hand. You bring it. You be the one to bring it. So she said, as the Lord God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks here that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son. We may eat and die. What, there's a good confession. <laughs> Elijah said to her, do not fear and go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake for her. In other words, you know, if you're gonna die, you don't need the cake anyway, so go ahead and make it for me. <laughs> Bring it to me and afterwards, make some bread for yourself and your son. She, she's like, you don't get it. There's just enough for one. There's not gonna be enough for me left over. Again, substance. What is the substance that we're giving to the Lord? For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of your flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. God seems like he likes to take something, the very thing that we make available to him is what we don't have a lot of fullness of. I got some rocks in my backyard. You want those? I'll be tough to get rid of them, but I'll be glad to have them. No, it has no value. He wants something that has a value to us and with us. And with that, with that substance, faith is a substance of what I'm hoping for. If I'm hoping to die, then that substance is, doesn't have any faith in it. But when the prophet starts telling her, this is what God really wants to do for you, that the bin will not run out until the day that rain comes. In essence saying, if you will respond then here's what's gonna happen. What I want us to notice out of this is that number one is God created a, a need in the widow so she could be the source of supply to the prophet. You never know that if your need may be, be the source of what God will use for the miracle to supply the need for someone else. Amen. Instead of saying, God, what are you gonna do for me? How are you gonna meet my need? How are you gonna supply for me? Instead of, though I don't have much, she's saying, I will give it to you because faith is a substance of things hoped for. I am hoping, hope is an expectation that has no visible means of being fulfilled. The things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now hear me on this. Complaining is the governing of the evil one. Complaining is saying to God, you haven't done a very good job of taking care of me. Why is it always this? Why do I always have fallen problem? Why does it always have to be me? Why is it always I'm the last one in line? I'm at the airport and until I, I, I was complaining about this so much, I said, whatever line I, I get in is gonna be the, the longest and the slowest line. So I just said, well, it's just prophetic. That's the way it is. I can't help it. Then I realized it's because I got what I complained. That which I feared came on me. And so I stood saying, Lord, I thank you that whatever line I get in, I'm going to be a blessing to every person I'm in line with. The next time was that the line was shorter. It was short. I said, oh, the devil just didn't want me to get close to somebody. <laughs> which wasn't really a truth, but it just made sense to me. So it happened, the more that you're thankful to the Lord for whatever condition state that you're in, give thanks to him because that says to him, God, you're able to supply all my needs according to your riches, not according to someone else's sensitivity about me. <laughs> I like what Pastor Olin, he uses a term they use as a trooper. He says, drag in your sack. I asked him one day, I said, what does that mean, drag in your sack? He said, you know what that means? I said, no. He said, if you ever want to tell somebody, he said, boy, that's a nice looking shirt or jacket you got on. Wish I had one like that. I can't afford it though. I guess, you know, you probably can, but I can't afford that. You know, and you say, oh, well, I just have to take what I have. That's dragging your sack, hinting that I want you to be the source of giving me what you have. 
What it's saying is, God, I don't trust you to do it for me. I'm going to figure a way to manipulate it and make it happen for myself. (laughs) Sure getting quiet. I don't want to drag my sack around and say, God doesn't take care of me. When as the neighborhood I grew up in, there was a lady, she lived, she was by herself, never married. She ran a little ticket booth down at the, down at the uh, amusement park. Most of you have gone through Amarillo, you've gone through the amusement park, you've seen it. Her name was Miss Mike Sell, Mike Sell. She always had cookies. And so I would go on up the, on the door and I'd knock. And her, she had shutters on that. It was all shut up. Nobody even, she looked like she was shut up inside there. And she would come and she said, yes. And I said, I haven't eaten in three days. <laughs> Do you have any cookies for me? And she'd bring a plate out and, and she said, how many do you want? Well, I got two pockets. So I put two in each pocket and go off. And she said, hold on, where do you live? Right there. I said, I know your parents. Do you want me to let it talk to them and see about why you're so hungry? No, 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 no. They'll be home after a while and I'll get plenty to eat later, but right now I'm hungry. <laughs> what we're saying is you have brought a bad report towards your parents. Well, somewhere down the line, I don't know how it happened, my brother or sister told mom and dad that I was going next door begging. And man, did I ever get a talking to. No son of mine is begging. You've got plenty to eat here. You've got everything you need. Do you know what that makes me look like? Well, made me fool that moment anyway. (laughs) When we complain against God, what we're saying is to, to the spirit world, God, you haven't done a very good job of providing for me, so I'm just going to take it on myself to make it happen anyway. The kingdom of God is a multifaceted, business-oriented, spirit-filled oriented, faith-filled oriented, and so those who enter into the kingdom of God do it through faith. Now, here's what's interesting John preached about the kingdom and never entered into the kingdom. Do I believe John's in heaven? Yes. It's possible to see the kingdom and never enter into it because it's not about your name being written in the book of life. It's about operating here on the earth under the favor of the king and under the authority of who he is. Everything we do, it says I'm trusting him or I'm not trusting him. Trust is the biggest factor and issue of that. One time uh, I had, there was another place in town that was giving food out, you know, and they came to me and, and uh, they wanted to see what we were doing here in Love Indeed and so on. And they came to me and they said, I recognize some of these people that's coming here and they've been coming over to our place and getting food. We need to stop that. And I said, why? He said, don't you know they're taking advantage of you? And I said, I've never been a taken advantage of my life. And he goes, oh, come on, pastor. You, that's a stretch. And I know you have, we all have. I said, no. Because if everything you do, you do it as under the Lord, then you haven't trusted them, you put it on them, and you've done it for the Lord, then therefore is that he's never disappointed you, and he's never taken advantage of you. When we start looking to flesh and blood to fulfill our needs, that means I'm trusting you to do it, and I'm no longer trusting God. And somewhere down the line, you will find people to disappoint you. I even disappoint me. I'm disappointed in myself sometimes. That's why I don't look in the mirror all that much. So when we get disappointed, what we're saying is my trust is in flesh and blood instead of looking to you. When you look in Luke, the 15th chapter, the prodigal son was that the elder brother who was there all the time was so upset because of, of the, his father's mercy towards this prodigal, this son that had gone away. And the father says to him, why are you so upset, this elder brother? You've never thrown a party for me. This elder brother did not understand how the kingdom of his father operated. He said, it's, everything here is yours. You could have had a party anytime you wanted it. But then you get so frustrated because you have looked at your brother, your elder brother, one who was dead but now has come alive. Why should I not rejoice? It's mine to give. But it's all, at any, any point in time, you could have delighted and enjoyed that because you didn't realize who you had, who your father was. You operated under a slavery mentality to him, though you were a son. 
but you acted like you were an orphan son. The kingdom of God is such to where that we, he'll supply all of our needs according to his riches in glory. His riches are operating in the kingdom of God. They're there. I just need to plug into the kingdom of God. I just need to look to him, the author and the finisher of my faith, and not look to someone else to be the faith for me. Will you pray and see if God will do something for for me because of you? No. He loves you and he wants you to come to him and know who he is and out of that response to that. So he's, he's, he's giving us understanding of how that we can move beyond what we see on the secular outside and step onto the inside. Now, two last things, I'm done. Something to look forward to. When Matthew, the 13th chapter, when Jesus is talking about the parable of the sower and the seed, and I'll get into more of this in the weeks to come. He said, first of all, he calls it the mysteries of the kingdom of God. Because it didn't make sense in the natural mind, so he said, I had to bring it down to something that you see every day and boil it down to a natural concept to give you an understanding of the spiritual concept. He said, depending on where the seed fell is depending upon what is the return. It's, there's nothing wrong with the seed. Second Corinthians 9 said, God gives seed to the sower. So that means anyone that's willing to sow, you've already have seed. You just may not recognize that it's seed. And when you take that seed and he went out and he broadcast anywhere, some of it fell upon hard ground. Some of it fell on ground that, that didn't get into the, the earth much and the fowls of the air, demonic spirits is the translation there, and they've taken and pulled it out of him. The Bible said immediately when the word of God is sown, the devil comes and tries to steal it, try to take it out. He said, but there's some that fall on good ground and it, and it brings forth 30, 60, 100 fold. So with that understanding, he's saying, if your heart can receive this and allow what I heal plant within you, it reproduces after its own kind. But it just doesn't reproduce a seed to a seed. It produces a seed to many seeds. It is multiplicated. (laughs) It's kind of a conjunctive between complicated and multiplied. It's multiplicated. (laughs) It's reciprocity, if you want a better word for it. And then he he begins to explain the kingdom of God operates like this. That you can't operate with your thinking in terms of this. or I just go do it but my heart has to be right in response to that. And in doing so, then I can see the kingdom of God moving and operating in the same way. Here's the last thing. Romans 12, one. Here's the big substance. Present your bodies a living sacrifice that is whole and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable expectation of worship is one translation. The biggest substance that God wants more than anything else is you and I present yourself. I can't present Pastor Jim. Here, take him. You can have him. I got it. (laughs) So what happens is that in the kingdom of God is that he's saying, present yourself before God. And by doing so, you become the substance that God originally created. And now we're giving him back the substance for which he created. And we're saying is, I belong to you totally. Not just every once in a while. Not just on good occasions. I'm happy when things are good, but I'm gonna be happy when things are not happy. And I always judge myself, I can judge myself in this way. Worship for me is the barometer of what's going on inside. If I am as intense with worship as I once was, then that means that I'm, I'm not a fair weather friend for God. Even when things are chaotic on the outside, I'm still going to be honoring and blessing him and showing forth everything on the outside and worshiping and honoring with intensity and presence of God going after him. Because I'm telling you, you can't bargain with God. You can't pout with God. Say, God, I'll tell you, I, I worshiped you and I was strong with you and now you, you, you haven't done what I wanted you to do. So therefore, you know what? I'm just going to hang back a little bit. I'll just show you. Well, God is not a man like you and I that you can manipulate. God is a spirit. And he looks upon the heart. He looks upon the issues. And we can't bargain him out of anything. When simply saying, then I'm going to leave you alone. Set you over here. Haven't forsaken you. But I'm just going to let you until the Holy Spirit can work inside of you. 
if we can understand that there's nothing impossible to them that believe, believe what? Believe the kingdom of God is at hand. It gives us such a confidence knowing that whatsoever you bound on earth, it's already been bound there. Then it's already, it can be bound here because of greater is he that's within you. You are substance. So, well, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have this, I don't have that. You have you. And Jesus didn't come and die for your stuff. He died for you. You're not taking your stuff to heaven. He's taking you. The real you is not what you see in the mirror. The real you is that spirit part of you inside that he wants to commune with. Stand with me if you would. Father, we're thankful that uh, you, you give us eyes to see beyond the natural realm and beyond...